there are CrossFitters out there where you'll stand next to him and you'll say, holy shit, you know, you look like the biggest human being I've ever seen. How'd you do that? He goes, I ran 10 miles a day. And they're like, oh, okay, that doesn't make very much sense. I am a little bit biased. I wanted to hear him say that it was the greatest thing ever and it made him super good and, you know, everybody's on him. And that's not what I came away with. What I came with was... Yo, so this is kind of exciting for me. It's really exciting for me. It's not really something that I ever saw myself really doing. Kind of a faux interview where I had somebody reach out to me on Instagram. I had somebody reach out to me and they were willing to recant upon their experience using steroids. This is particularly exciting because this person wants to recant their experience and they did CrossFit. So I know just about everybody probably watching this and maybe a few of you who are not are CrossFit people. I've gone down the rabbit hole of looking for information on this stuff. It's where I draw just about all of my knowledge on performance enhancing drugs, steroids, you have it. And there isn't very much out there. And when you look for stuff in relation to CrossFit and steroids, CrossFit and performance enhancing drugs, the pickings are even slimmer. I think that it's extremely cool that somebody watches my videos. As I was conversing with this individual, I could tell that they watched my videos and I could tell that they trusted me with this information. This person wants to remain anonymous and that's completely okay. So what I've done is I've transcribed the conversation. It was a two hour conversation. I don't know how long this is gonna take. I'm gonna make it now. I'm gonna go over the bullet points of the entire thing and I'm gonna try and paint a picture for this individual's experience using performance enhancing drugs at the stages in which this person had used them. So I should probably start off with why this person wants to remain anonymous. It should be rather obvious that if you live in the United States, it is not something that is legal. So you can't just run around saying, I take this and I take that, because if you do so, the police show up to your door and they say, hey, we heard that you admitted to using steroids. That is a class three drug, and as a class three drug, you can either you know get a huge fine or you can send them to some jail time, depending on the amount of drugs that you've got. We're gonna call this guy Bill, and the second reason that we're not going to talk about like who Bill is and why Bill wants to remain anonymous is because Bill was in the military. Bill's out of the military now and Bill doesn't want anything tied back to when he was in the military talking about this stuff. And those are the two reasons that you can't just go say, hey, this is what I do and he's doing it on his own. So he goes, hey man, do you want to tell my story for me? Because you're doing good and I want you to do good by me and spread my message so that people can hear it and understand a little bit what's going on here. And now that we've told you kind of why Bill doesn't want to be talked about, get into why he wanted to talk about it. And Bill wanted to talk about this. I'll talk about it later in the video, but because there is a lot of information that isn't out there. There's a lot of information that is out there and there's a lot of people who will say things and they'll say things without experience. I mean, I'm freaking one of them. I just sit here and I talk and I speculate and I speculate based upon things that I'll read on the internet from other people who probably haven't done it and they definitely haven't done CrossFit. So coming from Bill who has done CrossFit, Bill who has done performance enhancing drugs, Bill's message that he wants to tell you guys before you go into the entire story of this is that he thinks that he probably done all of this stuff without the enhancements of the performance enhancing drugs. It's cool that he had the experience, but through the story that you're about to hear, it comes out at the end that he was very uneducated while he was taking them. When he went into CrossFit, he kind of shied away from him. He didn't touch him for a little while. And he wanted to become as educated as possible before he possibly reintroduced them. And when he reintroduces them, it's not even for the purpose of doing better in CrossFit. If you're sitting here and you're looking for the story about how performance enhancing drugs and steroids are the reasons that people are the best in the sport of CrossFit, you might not want to watch the rest of the video. But if you want to get a story from somebody who has done them, has lived that life, knows what the positives and negatives, and he has the experience of all of this, then this might be the video for you. But I thought that this was a pretty good time for me to throw this in there. Throw this in along with the fact that the personal message of Bill and the opinion is that you're better suited to do all of this without taking steroids because you don't have to do with peaks in the valleys. You don't have to worry about whatever the people who are taking them have to worry about. You just have to worry about getting better, getting better each and every day. It's a little bit more linear that way. You have an understanding of everything that's going on in your body. So I'll keep on interjecting and I'll keep on saying things like this is something that Bill wanted to make apparent and it is Bill's story. And Bill was willing to tell the entire freaking YouTube world about this thing. So Bill totally has the right to go ahead in here and say, hey, make sure that you throw this in there. Make sure you throw in that in there. And what he wanted to throw in right here was that he wanted to make sure that you knew that if he were to do it all again, he would have done it all again, learning before he would have injected anything. And he thinks that steroids are not the route to getting better. Checkmate. So that you didn't have to wait 30 minutes to get the message of the story. So there's your message. 
We're going to move forward into the timeline of events and we're going to kick it off with the story of all this. So Bill is currently 32 years old. The story goes from present day, Bill 22 years old in the year 2022, all the way back to 2010. And he was a 20, 21 year old. He first was exposed to using anabolics in the military. From this individual's experience, he said that in the military, you had to hit a certain point as far as kind of your status or position or fitness level. And then they almost turned a blind eye to whether or not you were using performance enhancing drugs. And the reason that this was the case is because in war, there was nothing other than staying alive. And if the military thought that you using some sort of performance enhancing drugs would help you do your job in the military, then what do they care? This is kind of what I was picking up from talking to Bill on this phone call. So he was with his roommate one day, he went into his roommate's fridge and there was a bag of saline solution. He goes, what's that? And his roommate said that it was HGH. Now, Bill's 20 years old. Bill has no idea what this stuff is going on. But what he had heard is that HGH has some sort of issues enlarging the heart and internal organs. And it's not something that he was interested in. But this is right where the rabbit hole started to open up. And he started to get into the fact that this is stuff that you guys do. And his roommate goes, yeah. And once he hit that certain threshold, he started to look into anabolic steroids. Now, Bill also made it rather clear that this isn't something that happens in every branch of the military, and it's not even really something that happens in his particular branch of the military. So if you're in the service right here and you're watching this video, he wanted to make it very clear that this is not just something that he's trying to spread a message saying everyone in the military is using drugs. But if you happen to be doing it, then it happens to also be that when he was in his branch, it was something that they would let slide at a point sometimes. He was a case where all those things aligned and this is what happened. So I asked Bill, I go, all right, so you hit the threshold. You understand that you're not going to get in trouble for it. You understand that the military is wanting you to survive. And when all these things line up, what was your first cycle? What did it look like? And he goes, I did testosterone at 500 milligrams. And I'm thinking, okay, 500 milligrams. That sounds about what I've heard that people do on their first cycle. And he goes, three times a week. And I was thinking, holy shit. All right, Bill, like, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, I know. It was a little bit overboard. So he was doing 1,500 milligrams of testosterone. He said E, P, and C. That's just like a sustenon type of testosterone. He was overseas. He said that he was admittedly not that educated on the entire thing. So he took 15 hundred milligrams of testosterone and he said that he went from about a body weight of 205 in the military all the way up to about 240 pounds and he, he did so in a series of about two and a half months which is just something that can't happen anywhere it's something that i tell talk about on the channel and i talk about when you look at certain athletes fluctuating in body weight up down and around this is the sort of thing that'll happen and this is a wild example because bill also said that on his first cycle he took a winstrol an injectable winstrol he was taking up to six to seven injections a week because he was injecting the testosterone on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. He was injecting the Winstraw on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. He was doing one CC per injection, which was like 250 milligrams from what he said, ended up being, I don't know, 1,250 milligrams-ish. And when it's underground stuff like this, you never really know, but that's what the bottle said he said. I asked him, can't you just mix those together? Because if it's an oil, you usually mix the oil compounds. And he goes, I didn't know that. I was trying to be as sterile as possible. He didn't want to get into trouble with this, like getting an infection overseas and have to deal with his leg falling off or something because of an infection. Clean needles every time he had said, he said that he used alcohol swabs to make sure and he just like made sure everything was as clean as possible. He'd take a shower before and after. He was pretty anal about not getting in trouble with this as far as infection goes. But I asked why, why Winstrol? He goes, because in the popular news back then, you heard about Marion Jones at the freaking Olympic getting in trouble for Winstrol. So he called a buddy because back then you didn't have this freaking thing. You didn't have the cell phone where you can just go and find out anything on the internet. You can't do what I did present day. So he called his buddy and goes, all right, I'm looking into Winstrol. I'm on testosterone. What can I do with Winstrol? He goes, you know, you're in the military, you're going to try and get better. It'll make you better at whatever you want to be better at. Okay, explain. Because you want to be faster, it'll make you faster. You want to be stronger, it'll make you stronger. You want to be leaner, it's going to make you leaner. This is what Bill was told. So Bill also started to use Winstrol. He was unfamiliar with the dosage exactly, but he said he took a milliliter on Tuesday and Thursday, along with the 1,500 milligrams of testosterone, which will lead to that extreme blow up in body weight, which he said was all lean tissue, which is just absurd. And I think right about now is we're going to get wrapped up in the story and you're going to say, that sounds freaking cool. And I'm sitting here telling you to don't do this stuff. Don't freaking do this stuff. Bill is an example. Bill is telling us like what happens because it's a good story. Like, thanks Bill for sharing your story. But this isn't Bill telling you, hey, you know, you're going to go use Winstraw and you're going to get to be fucking huge. Like, don't do that. Also, 
Bill wanted to make it very clear. And he said, hey, this is the one thing you got to make abundantly clear. He goes, have you ever had a penicillin shot? And I go, no, but I'm assuming you have because you're in the military. He goes, yeah, we have all of those like up-to-date giant shots. And he goes, when you start sticking needles in your butt the way you need to. So he de- described the process in which you need to like fold over a part of your butt cheek and aim for a certain hemisphere or quadrant of your butt cheek. You alternate butt cheeks. So it's like Monday, right side, Tuesday, left side, Wednesday, right side, Thursday, left side. And you just go back and forth. Eventually it turns into a pin cushion. And it hurts like a motherfucker. He said, this is something that isn't ever talked about in steroids. And he said that he had just like the worst sight pain. And it just, so he did want to say that it just kind of sucks. And he goes, if you ever had a pen, penicillin shot it's just something where you feel it maybe it's a big needle or somewhat something but he goes make sure you tell everybody that it hurts and it's not a fun thing to be doing and i'm also addressing that here because i'm also telling you not to do it just have fun with the video okay right about there he starts talking about his second cycle he starts talking about his second cycle because this is where he started to see the most benefit of it so he did the first one at age 21 or so he did the 1500 milligram in the wind straw he did it for two and a half months he got up to 240 pounds and then he said he took some time off just because he was moving around he said he came back from overseas and when you come back from overseas, you can't bring everything with you that you had on you overseas because it's illegal in the United States. And if you're bouncing around, you can't have all that stuff. So we went from 1,500 milligrams of testosterone down to zero, just like that. He recollects that he was sitting in a classroom doing some sort of educational stuff and he was going through hot flashes and cold spurts and he said it was almost as if he was going through menopause that's because of the huge fluctuations in the hormones that happens when you go through a cold turkey cut from something that high down to that low i believe he also mentions that he got a little bit of gynecomastia so his boobs grew a little bit like they would if you were a female going through freaking puberty. So he took about two months off. He came down to about 220. I had mentioned the fluctuations. There you go from 240 down to 220 in two months. And he's still doing the exact same stuff. Again, I had also told you that he very admittedly doesn't know what he's doing at this point in his life. He's in the military. He's taking a bunch of steroids and he doesn't even know how to work out. And all of these things are happening while he doesn't even know how to work out. So he says that during his second cycle, he realized that he was able to recover incredibly quick, not just between sessions, but within sessions themselves. So he references a workout that he had seen from somebody named John Meadows, who's very big in the bodybuilding industry. And he said that he was able to move an entire stack doing curls on a cable machine. And the entire stack is something like 200 to 250 pounds. He was able to do 15 reps. And it's something that he could not do when he was off cycle. When he was on cycle, he was able to do the entire stack for 15, take a 20 second break, do the entire thing for 15, take a break, do the entire thing for 15. And he said he could repeat that just until he felt like he was done. Now, this is where you get to see the benefit of putting all of that volume onto your body. So one, it gives you the ability to do it. And two, everything that you're putting into your body is now giving you the ability to recover and do it and get bigger and better from the volume. It's something that you cannot do as a normal human being. So his first cycle, he was at 1,500 milligrams in wind straw. His second cycle, he said he did half of the amount of testosterone of the first one. So he did 750 milligrams per week of testosterone. That was it. And he was doing all of these bicep curls and all of this stuff at just that dose, which was half of what he took before. I was curious, kind of what he got up to. What was your, what were your numbers? What were the best things that you can remember from the year 2013? He told me that he was able to do 39 reps of the bench press at 225 pounds. And that's way more than I've ever done. It's freaking record NFL combine numbers from what I know. It's just something that's super stupid crazy. He was 220 pounds. He said he had about 10 to 15% body fat and he did that amount of repetitions. He also said that he was able to back squat 455 and he was also able to do 405 for 19 reps to what he had said was just above parallel as a you know football player type of squat. That was all at the age of about 23 back in the year 2013. So what Bill wanted to make clear here was that you don't need to take all a whole bunch of crap to get a whole bunch of benefit like a little goes a long way for a lot of people so where he said he was at 1500 freaking milligrams in his first cycle he's hitting all of these awesome things at just 750 which is half without the wind straw so no, no wind straw just testosterone and he's hitting like the freaking ca- crazy cable machine workouts and he's experiencing the recovery aspect of everything and that was something that you know you don't really think about because all you think is more is better more is better more is better and more is not better And as you're gonna hear towards the end of the video, like really any of it isn't better at all if you don't know what the hell you're doing because he didn't know what he was doing when he started. And once he starts to educate himself quite a bit, which you get into around like the 20 minute mark or so of this video, you're gonna find out that when you know what you're doing, you can get pretty far without anything and probably arguably further than anybody who goes and does it without knowing how they're doing it. 
CrossFit. And the, one of the biggest things that I was curious about is how this all tied into CrossFit. So he starts up CrossFit in the year 2016, and this is now three years after a break. So he takes a break in his cycle. During his break, he says that he gets really big. He says he goes from about 15% body fat all the way up to 30% body fat. And this is something that happens from what I know and the stories that I've read. And I've read a lot of stories about people who do steroids is that when you do them and you're doing them to kind of get a kick and you're having fun with it and you don't know what's happening, that you're going to, when you come off of it, go through a lull. And if it might just be what I had talked about where he was expressing what happened at the menopause type ages when he came off of that big cycle and he had the estrogen kick. Or maybe it's just the fact that you don't want to work out if you don't get that sort of huge kick. A lot of the times these people just balloon up and this is what happened to Bill. Bill ballooned up to about 30% body fat and he said he was eating Carl's Jr. all the time. But just like the video that I made on obesity is a choice, Bill made a choice to get back after it. In 2016, Bill found CrossFit and Bill decided to like pursue CrossFit. He decided to do so for a long period of time without using any anabolics. A long time. Bill also spoke of an injury that he had. So in his second cycle, he kind of threw his back out because he didn't even understand that when you were doing stuff under a load, you needed to brace your core. It's something that a lot of us, and you probably know watching this video, but in 2013, he was the dude on all these steroids and he was just throwing himself in the bottom of a squat and he threw his back out. And that's kind of what stopped him from lifting weights for a little bit of time. Bill decided that after his first cycle, he learned that it wasn't too smart to go about doing things without education. So Bill went and got an education. He got his CrossFit level one. He did power athlete. He did West Side Barbell, TTP training. He did the TRX clinic, Russian kettlebell pose, running mobility wad. And he has just about every certification that you've heard under the sun at this point. And this is something that I can pick on having listened to Bill over the course of our phone call is that he's a well-educated person at this point. And it doesn't sound anything like what he described as the person who just did a reckless steroid cycle back in the year 2012. And he's a very smart guy. So now, of course, at this point, I was very curious about what he looked like as an athlete. He was, he was about 6'1", 6'2". He liked to model himself after Tommy Hackenbrook, which was a big name right around that area about the 2016 time. And he was chasing all of his numbers naturally at this point. You can say naturally, but he did take steroids in 2013. So I wanted to kind of tie together how much of a benefit he had from that point in time. So we mentioned his back squat numbers. He said that he was able to do a 405 back squat for five reps. He was able to do a 515 deadlift, a 345 clean, a 335 clean and jerk, and uh, 295 snatch from the blocks. He says that he had to start off at about a 305 clean, and it wasn't something that was easy for him. And he's always been a big and strong guy. So even before he did steroids back in the day, he said that he was built to be a big and strong guy. The steroids made him bigger and stronger. The jury is out through our conversation whether or not there was a large carryover benefits he would have reaped from that sort of a time duration. We talk about this a little bit more later, but the big thing that he said is that he worked up to a 385 bench press present day just having done the CrossFit methodology type deal. So he learned that through proper movement, mobility, positionings, bracings, that he was able to add 50 pounds to his bench press without using anabolics in the modern day that you would call 2019 to 2021. Pretty wild to hear considering back when he was on all of that shit, it teaches you that it is important to know how you're moving things. And it's very important to take things seriously. You can't just say, oh, steroids do it all for you because he's a pretty good case, but that doesn't happen. Okay, so he does all of this stuff. He's in CrossFit. He hasn't used performance enhancing drugs since the year 2013 or so. He's been doing all of this stuff, learning everything, using the conjugate method to get all these strength gains and everything's going good, but then he has shoulder issues. He has shoulder issues. He gets a slap tear. His rotator cuff's all messed up and he needs to get surgery. This is when Bill decides to deploy some testosterone. He wants to use the testosterone, so he wants to help his body get a little bit of a kick in the recovery department. And all of this happened back in the year 2019. So he's been in CrossFit now for three years and three years into CrossFit, he gets like the CrossFit injury, the freaking slap tear that happens when you do the kipping pull-ups and yeah, we've heard it. Bill became a victim to the freaking slap tear. He goes to the doctor and he goes, all right, surgery's in two weeks. So he goes to his buddy and his buddy gives him some freaking testosterone. His buddy tells him to take 300 milligrams a week and that's going to be just enough to help him aid his recovery. So Bill starts taking it two weeks before the surgery. It's a uh, ester that would have taken about that long for it to get into his bloodstream. So by the time he's in the surgical room, it's already working for him. So he gets all the surgery done. He's in a sling. He says he can't move his arm. And then four weeks later, he goes and has his first checkup. 
this entire time. Now, six weeks, he's been using some testosterone. Therapist that he goes to see for his checkup tells him that he's about four months greater recovered than he should be. And what does that tell you? It tells you that cut and dry, the testosterone has a huge benefit when it comes to his recovery. He says that present day is able to extend it and he's already working back towards putting a bar overhead, putting his arms over it. So he got, he says he has awesome positions up and over his head. And it's something that should not be possible without something, something helping you out. I was really hoping to get a little bit of a how does it help you do CrossFit? Does it make you much better at CrossFit? What I ended up getting was hearing that when you have some sort of an injury, it helps you come back really, really, really quick and much quicker than it would have ever had been possible without that stuff. Yeah, sure, you can chalk it up and say maybe he's just a genetic freak and he's gonna get better, but he's the dude who's in the military. He's the dude who's doing all this bench press stuff. He's a dude who says that he didn't know how to work out for a large period of his life and was doing a lot of it. And he really fucked up his shoulder. And at the age of 29, he had to go have shoulder surgery. He took the testosterone. He only took it for six weeks at this point in time. And he saw that it really helped him get right back up to it. And then he stopped again because he used it. It did what it was supposed to do. And then he stopped. He didn't even use it for performance enhancement. He used it for the recovery purposes, which is something that a lot of people forget that it's best at. So something that we're not talking about all that much, when Bill went and did his surgery, he said he had a testosterone level of about 400, which is about to be expected for somebody who's been off of a huge steroid cycle for that amount of time. It's not very high. It's not stupid low, but it's not that optimal. So Bill went on the testosterone. Of course, it's going to come up because it's an exogenous source of testosterone. He came off of it once he was fully recovered. The cool part of the conversation that Bill and I went into was his recovery from the tanking of his testosterone levels. So typically when you come off of a testosterone, people think about doing a PCT and Bill didn't do that. But what he did was he formulated a new diet for himself. Not so much that he made a new one, but he explored avenues of basically becoming a hippie as he calls it. He would do things like grounding and he would do things like sun tanning naked and he would do things like not using the soap with all the chemicals in it. And he would use different herbs and whatnot. He also would eliminate the sugars, the stuff that they tell you to do in the CrossFit methodology. Refined carbohydrates are the freaking devil, says Bill, and says the CrossFit methodology, says Greg Glassman. And he took his testosterone level right before the surgery, before he started going on the exogenous source, and it was at 434. As he started to do it every two months, and he was implementing and deploying these new methods that he was looking into, he said he went from a 434 to a 501. He went from a 501 to a 734. And then he was like, oh, cool, this stuff is working. I didn't need to do a PCT. I don't even need to take testosterone. He went from that 700 number up to a 900 number. And the doctor's okay, okay, what's going on over here? He went from the 900 number to 1,000 to 1100 and he said that 1100 was the highest he had ever got doing the things that he was doing with what he said the most intense form of the diet he did was he would eat he would eat decimal point over in red meat every single day for dinner not raw but just red meat so he would go and get like the big freaking chunks of like a pot roast or a brisket or something and he would eat if you weigh 200 pounds you would eat two pounds and he weighed 220 pounds. So he would eat 2.2 pounds of red meat every single night. And he said, this is the biggest thing that would kick him for like that 700 testosterone range up to the 900 testosterone range. He did it a mist, taking out everything except for water and coffee. Coffee was his constant was what he said. No potatoes, no rice. He would have some seasonal fruit. Seasonal fruit is a word that he used quite consistently. He brings up the lion diet. He brings up the fact that he is currently Catholic. So gin on his diet with the exception of Sunday, where he lets himself go a little bit. And amidst all of this, all of his blood markers happened to do better. His HDL went up, his LDL went down 10 to 15 points. He said his resting heart rate dropped over 15 beats and his blood pressure dropped over 25 points. He said he did this basically from doing the meats and the seasonal fruits, along with all the other things. So this is a conversation that I didn't really expect to have with this guy. It's a conversation that ended up being really cool. It's a conversation that came on the day in which I released a video saying, it's your choice to be fat. It was this guy's choice to either get the best out of his life and optimize his life again, or he could have gone on TRT, which is a lot of things that people will end up doing. And either one is okay. It's your body. You can do whatever you want with it as long as you're happy and you're doing well by yourself. I've said it a couple times here where I tried to do the best by what Bill was telling me. And Bill was trying to tell me that in his later years when he was doing CrossFit and all the way up to present day, he was optimizing everything for his health and wellness. And he saw this through his blood markers. He did want to make sure that it was understood that although he is probably the best version of himself right now, he has to do way more work to get there. And when he was utilizing the testosterone 
or the testosterone and the winstrol. He didn't even know what he was doing and he was seeing quite a bit of po progress. So while it is possible to become the best version of yourself and do things that will lead you to a lot of performance enhancing without taking any of these drugs, the drugs definitely serve a purpose and they definitely do help and they definitely get you to places without doing anywhere near as much work as he's doing right now. So it would have been doing a disservice to kind of leave it by saying, just eat a bunch of red meat and all of a sudden you're going to be just as good as if you're taking steroids because that's not really the case per the discussion that we had, of course. Now, of course, here's me, and I got on this phone call with this guy who said he was going to recant his story, and he was going to give me a little bit of perspective about what it was like to do steroids and how he looks at the CrossFit world as a result of that. So I did steer it back in that direction. One of the things that Bill and I had talked about is the fact he watches my videos, he watched the video on steroids, and he was very much in agreement that one of the best things that you can do is see where somebody came from and see what they're doing now. You look at their sporting background. So if there's someone who looked like a rail, and even if it was eight years ago, you looked like a rail, and now all of a sudden you look like a professional bodybuilder, it's something that isn't going to be realistic really ever. Bodybuilders put all of this work and all of this time into their life. If they're natural, there are crossfitters out there who look better than a natural level bodybuilder. Natural level bodybuilders are doing everything they can with all the genetic potential in order to look as good as they can. And there are crossfitters who are putting in one fifth of the effort and looking better. And that is one of the things that Bill wanted to tell me and let you guys know that is something where his and my thoughts align on that. When you look at a crossfitter who's doing burpees and all of a sudden their shoulders, chest, and everything blows up, that is basically their main form. Half of what they're doing is conditioning, where 100% of what a bodybuilder is doing is trying to grow the muscle as big as you can. And when you compare the two, if they were both natural, you would expect for the bodybuilder to look leaps and bounds better than the crossfitter. And this is just a cut and dry argument in his head and in my head. There are CrossFitters out there where you'll stand next to him and you'll say, holy shit, you know, you look like the biggest human being I've ever seen. How'd you do that? He goes, I ran 10 miles a day. And they're like, oh, okay, that doesn't make very much sense. And that would be the other thing that Bill wanted to expand upon is when he would speak to these people, you would almost be able to hear the verbiage in which they would say things. So you watch a video with so-and-so's training program and you say, okay, so you got to do that clean and jerk by doing one single on a clock sometimes with no plan and no accessory work, that's how you got to hit a 405 pound clean with great positions, no injuries ever. Some of the thought processes that I wanted to get into with bringing it back into talking about the steroid thing, although the diet thing was cool, it was like, but I wanna talk about the steroid thing. So that was some more of it and there's more. Very early on in the conversation, Bill was talking about his military experience and when he was first getting into his cycles he would also talk about how he would have people who were educated enough where they could blood dope and when they would be deployed in an area where it was mountainous it was almost just something that they would do it's like all right we're going to take your blood we're going to put it into this blood kit it's going to be there and when we need you to use it you're going to put the blood back in and all of a sudden your lungs are in a fire like they've never fired before it's going to be as if you're just walking around on an, an average day but you're going to be hiking up freaking mount everest and you're going to be doing elevation everyone around you will be dying and you're going to be just fine and he's like, this has to be 100% something that's being done at the CrossFit Games. And they go, do they test for this? And I go, nope, they take a piss test and that's it. So Lance Armstrong got caught for blood doping. They, he got caught for blood doping and they drew blood. You draw blood, you get caught blood doping. So when you hear what Bill has to say here, which is something along the lines of, if he was able to do a three minute friend, and he went and blood doped, he'd be able to do a two minute friend. And he'd be able to do that because there would be no sort of downstream pain that would occur when he would be doing that sort of thing. His lungs, you wouldn't feel them because you have all this extra blood volume in there and you have all this extra oxygenated blood in there. He said that the effects of this would last up to 48 to 72 hours. From his experience, having done it in the military, climbing the mountains, he goes, yeah, 48, 72 hours, I would still be feeling great. And then he said that he also could kind of parallel that into his CrossFit experience. He says, you're doing something like Murph, 40 minute Murph. Okay, now you're doing it in 32 to 34 minutes, just because it's taking you off that much of a strain on your lungs in particular, and also just the occlusions and the muscle contractions that you would be going through. So if you have oxygenated blood and it's just shipping through your body and your heart doesn't have to do all this work to get like fresh blood to the muscles, then you're going to be a perfect human being. And this is something that I also thought was very cool because this is not something that I've gone down the rabbit hole of. I looked at anabolics. I know some about peptides. I know about all of the SARMs. I know about the GP agonists, but I don't know anything really about blood doping. And he goes, it's so easy where you go freaking on the internet and you can buy a kit 
and you can buy a kid, and it's like $700, and this is what his buddy did when they were in the military. So they turn a blind eye. You want to do better, you want to climb the mountains, you can do the blood doping. You do the blood doping, and all of a sudden you're working as a better soldier, and like, what do they care if you're working as a better soldier? Draw the blood, you put the blood in the fridge, the fridge spins it up for you, four or five weeks later, you put the blood back in, and it's just your blood. It's not like it's something that you got out of the freaking wilderness or a foreign country. So he said, arguably, he felt that it was even safer than doing a steroid. And again, this is a good time for me to say, don't do it. I wouldn't recommend you do it. You know, sketchy to be drawing your blood and then putting your blood back in. I think that I could probably kill myself if I tried to do that. But I know that people like Lance Armstrong did it, but people like Lance Armstrong also probably had the best doctors in the world also helping them do it. The way that he was doing it with this little fridge, it seemed a little bit like, oh shit, dude, like, ugh. put this blood in the fridge and then I'm going to put the blood back in me and all of a sudden I'm going to win the CrossFit Games. Like, that sounds ridiculous, but he did say that it is something that when you're educated enough about it, that it's likely that it's being used high level CrossFit. And then one last final thing that we definitely share thoughts on, it's something that I haven't even spoken on to this point, is when you know how much the stuff costs, when you hear people talk about how much they spend on it and then you see the benefit that they get from using what they're using, it really gives you a different perspective about the supplement industry. So him and I both shared our perspective. It really makes you upset when people are saying, buy my progenics crap and make sure you buy the nighttime progenics, the morning progenics, the post-workout shake progenics. And don't worry, that's just going to be 250 bucks when if you go to a TRT clinic and 100 bucks a month, you're getting optimized hormones that's male and female email 3,000 times the benefit in a fraction of the cost of what you're going to end up spending just listening to these companies promote their shit. And then one last final thing that we want to talk about branching off of the supplement topic is that some people can very much use this to better their lives. Some people use them as supplementation. If you look at professional bodybuilding, powerlifting, they just use them. It's completely okay to be using them in certain organizations within powerlifting and certainly in bodybuilding. They don't tell you about it. They don't talk about it, but they're totally using it. There are doctors across the freaking country who are able to prescribe testosterone to these people. There are even some who are pre prescribing some of the trade name drugs like the Anivars and that stuff at these TRT clinics to optimize male health. This sounds a lot to me like the marijuana industry. So there was a point in time in which every single thing you find marijuana on somebody and then all of a sudden you'd go to jail. And if you were a dealer, you were in super jail. Don't pass go. Steroids, it's going to end up being very similar. The second that they figure out how to tax it, it's going to be like Canada, where if you cross the border, you can just go do it. You can have it. You can like walk around the street and like, look, here's my steroids. But that's not how it works in the United States because they don't know how to tax it yet. They don't know how to make money on it yet. And it's one of those things where when you look at it that way, okay, marijuana is now legal in Colorado, Illinois. And it's like, well, why are steroids legal in Canada, but in Mexico, but not in the United States? It's because they don't know how to make money on them yet. But the second they figure out how to make money, they're going to be free game for everybody, but probably still still a banned substance within sport. So now we're going to see how I can do on recapping this entire freaking video. So I came into it talking to the guy who said that he had done steroids and he has done CrossFit and he wanted to share his experience. And what I was hoping to hear is I, I am a little bit biased. I wanted to hear him say that it was the greatest thing ever and it made him super good and you know, everybody's on him. And that's not what I came away with. What I came with was this is a guy who found out how good the CrossFit methodology is. It's something that he wishes that he had used back in the day when he was, you know, abusing the shit out of the substances. He's a great example of somebody who learned from his mistakes. So he knew that he shouldn't be doing those things. He knows that he needs to be putting in the work so that he can understand what he's doing while he's doing it so that he can do things like get a better bench press without using steroids. This is a guy who's a very, very well educated person who gets his blood work done every single two months now. Somebody who has more certifications than I do. Somebody who, like me, has seen a lot of people who do a lot of things and you can almost like pick out who's doing what and why they're doing it, when they're doing it, what they're doing it for. But the biggest takeaway is that it's helpful in recovery in particular. This is what we've seen through Bill's experience, being able to recover quicker with his shoulder injury. He recovered very quickly from it. I brought up whether or not he thinks that 
it was something in which he used a long time ago and all of a sudden there's like some neuro firing that happens in his body. So his body now knows what it's capable of. And he did say that, yes, have that back of your head ability to remember that you were able to do certain things at a certain point in time. It always makes it a little bit easier to be able to do it present day. But I also draw that up to social media. So a lot of the reason that a lot of these people are doing a lot of these awesome things is because when you see things on the phone, on the internet, you now know that it's possible. It's the entire sensation that happens when, hey, somebody broke the four minute mile and now everyone's breaking the four minute mile. And before you know it, there's gonna be people breaking the two hour marathon. And then there's gonna be a lot of people breaking the two hour marathon. This is just happening on an individualistic scale. So Bill here knew that he could do certain things with his body. He knew that his body was capable of doing these things. And granted, he was able to do them under the assistance of performance enhancing drugs in his early twenties. He now said, okay, I've got all this knowledge. Knowledge is power. That's my thing, right? And when he applied the knowledge to himself, he was able to surpass the things that he was able to do when he was that age. Now, if you were to do both of them at the same time, he still thinks that he, yeah, probably you do a little bit better, but there's always like a depreciating return with those things. He thinks that blood doping is probably more prevalent in the sport of CrossFit, more so than the anabolic use. Things that like the peptides are probably more commonly used because they clear a little bit quicker. And all in all, it was just a very cool experience for me to be able to talk to somebody who trusted me so much to, you know, put their information out there. And, you know, he had this whole conversation with me. I know his name. He's like, hey, Andrew, this is very cool. So if there's anybody else out there who wants to, you know, do one of these with me, I had a good time, like, creating the freaking document where all of timestamps in our conversation that ended up being two hours long. It took me, like, six hours to put this freaking video together. And I hope that you guys learned something from it. And I hope that probably the big thing that you're going to take away is that if you have the good diet lifestyle, if you go through the educational processes that CrossFit will put you through and you just want to be a better person, that you don't need to fall back onto steroids in order to do them. And do they help? Yeah, sure. They probably help. They probably help a lot for certain things and certain times, but that's not what you can take away from this conversation with Bill. And if you like this, like I said, it took me a long goddamn time. So it was a freaking 30 minute video, like and subscribe to the channel. I see that there's there's 2000 views from my subscribers and then there's 10,000 views from other channels. So if you're one of the 10,000, subscribe to my channel, please. It was a good time. Andrew Hiller, bye.